Shalom, good afternoon. I apologize again for the delay. We we're waiting for Ambassador Indic, but uh, you know, traffic in Jerusalem. I'm uh, privileged to open uh, this conference, this third annual conference on the Middle East in transition, uh, on behalf of the Truman Institute, the Institute of Asian and African Studies, the Department of Islamic and Middle East Studies, and I would like to mention especially the kind assistance of Ruth and Mordechai Abir, Damos here, uh, for their generous donation. And uh, I hope very much that uh, Ambassador Martin Indic will join us. As you can see, I'm opening it unofficially because the official opening is later, which means that maybe they uh, give a prominence to the panel on Palestinians, or maybe they think that Palestinian issues are not part of the Middle East in transition, which I beg to differ. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you'll realize that the Palestinians had their own changes, development, and upheaval before the Arab Spring. Uh, I don't want to go back to history, but we can mention the first Intifada in 87, and the Oslo Accords, and the second Intifada, and the election, and Hamas, and what have you. All of this, I suppose, we're going to discuss in this panel, which uh, is uh, composed of very, very good uh, scholars. I also regret that uh, Sufiana Buzaida, Dr. Sufiana Buzaida, uh, is not participating. And uh, I would like you here to recognize Ambassador Martin Indyk, who just entered in. Anyway, we started with... <laughs> Please. Uh, again, I regret that uh, Dr. Sufyan Abu Zaide is not present. Uh, I, I hope it's not, it doesn't indicate a new policy on behalf of, the, of Palestinian intellectuals who uh, have cooperated uh, with Israeli scholars for years. And if scholars don't cooperate and talk, who is going to do it? And uh, I hope it's not a, a new policy for, for them to uh, stop uh, talking to, uh, to Israelis. In any case, we have a very a good panel that can discuss uh, the issues. And uh, the first is going to be uh, Roni Shaked on the Palestine between occupation and statehood, efforts to break through the dead end in shadow of the internal conflict. And I'm sure many of you know Roni is one of the best analysts on Palestinian affairs in, his, in Israel. He works for Idiot Achronot, which is a a largest circulated paper in Israel. He is a PhD candidate in the Middle East Department of, of, of the Hebrew University. And he, his dissertation focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And the topic is the ethos of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, uh, within the Palestinian society. He's written three books on Hamas, on Kapuchi, the general security services in the hills of terrorists, and the development of nation of movement of Israeli-Palestinian citizens, which is now in press. I would like very much to uh, ask Roni Shaked to say what he has to say in 20 minutes. Thank you, Moshe. Good afternoon. As Moshe as Moshe said, we are in the first session here talking about the Palestinians, and you all have to understand that the Palestinians were not part of the Arab Spring, and the Arab Spring was not part of their social political life. The Arab Spring passed over them, even ignored them, but nevertheless, it's affected them negatively. Pushed them aside, they lost the backbone of the Arab world, especially after President Mubarak, who has been their patron over the past years, has been overthrown. Recent international development have not been good for the Palestinians. Their attempt to elevate the status of a, their status at the United Nations has been stalled. President Obama is involved in the new election campaign, and the Palestinian feeling is that he has turned his back to them, on them. 
Europe is busy with its economic crisis. The Israeli Netanyahu government is not responsive for the Palestinians. And the priority of the Middle East is not anymore the Palestinians, is the Iranian. Now the Palestinians are not the focus of the Middle East discourse. The rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was a blow to Abbas and encouraged Hamas. But on the other hand, Hamas has lost, ho lost his, his host base in Syria and is looking for a new host country. Meanwhile, Hamas is making all the efforts to intensify the relationship with Egypt and the Arab world. In order to achieve legitimacy, it requires them to show more responsibility and more moderation in order to, to, to even to change the outlook of the region. Just 10 days ago, if we are talking about Hamas, Khaled Mashal was said in an interview in Al Jazeera that during the Arab Spring, popular resistance is preferable. In another inter interview, he said that the common goals between Fatah and Hamas is the establishment of Palestinian state within 1967 border. If you want or not, this is a new melody of Hamas. In order to pave the way for the next round of confrontation with Israel and in order to overcome the political deadlock, the Palestinians, both the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, are making efforts for reconciliation and reunification. Abu Mazen, as all other Palestinian leaders, understood that unity is the key condition for the political success. In summer 2009, the Palestinian initiated a new strategy in order to overcome the political deadlock. This strategy was built several months after the establishment of Netanyahu government, and it was encouraged by President Obama and his vision for two-state solution, and his demand from Israel to freeze all the uh, settlement activity. A new strategy, the new strategy is based on stopping direct negotiation with Israel, and initiate arrangement or par partial solution on, on partial solution and to sit at the negotiation table only on the basis of two-state solution and only after Israel will freeze all the activity in the, 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 in the, in the settlement, including East Jerusalem. The strategy is based on promoting statehood through international politics and legal framework and for most to be accepted to the United Nations with full membership on the basis of Palestinian state within 1967 borders. The strategy is to build, was built on four step program. Step one was a practical measure of state building in bottom up process, including governmental capacity and political readiness for statehood. The program includes moder modernization of society, culture, and habits by, for example, opening, opening cinema, theater, a, a sport field, focusing on law and order, on human rights, and on women rights. Many improvements have been achieved. For instance, the governor of Ramallah is a woman. The deputy governor of Nablus is a woman. Uh, and three women were appointed as a Sharia judges in the West Bank. That's a real revolution in the Arab world and in the Islamic world. Step two of this, uh, of this initiative was side by side with the state of building uh, to, 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 to start launching an international diplomatic campaign in order to obtain maximum support for being recognized in the United Nations. Step three, it's a new agenda for struggle and for resistance against the Israeli occupation. The core of this tactic was to cease using all types of armed resistance and to apply what they called popular uprising, Mukawa Mesilmiye. This means banning all types of terrorism and at the same time to fight and prevent terrorism with the full cooperation and coordination with the Israeli security forces, regardless of political process or including in times of crisis. Step four was the complicated and the most difficult one. It was the reconciliation with Hamas. We have to be honest. The state building process is on its way with success. The Palestinian struggle in the West Bank against terrorism has achieved very good results. 
the international campaign has also achieved results. 126 countries all over the world is recognized Palestine as a state within the 1967 border. It's also something. Hamas is another story. The conflict with Hamas is no less treating and acute uh, in acute. This struggle between national movement and Islamic movement existed before Oslo. It, 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 it started back in the 1970s, was intensified in the outbreak of the first intifada and, 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 and then been further, uh, further aggra aggravated after Oslo. With the help of democratic election in 2006, and let me be honest, Abu Mazen was compelled by the State Department to hold election, Hamas achieved a tremendous victory. The victory in the election was milestone in Hamas' ambition plan to take over the PA and the PLO and all the existing, polit all the existing political framework of the Palestinian. The struggle led in 2007 to a full division between Gaza and the West Bank and create a new reality, two states for one nation. The struggle between Hamas and the, and the, 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 the national movement is not unique to the Palestinians. The same struggle has occurred in the past 40 years in most of the Arab countries. We are witnessing the result of the election in Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco that reflected this struggle. A year ago, something like this, 14 a month ago, the Palestinians decided, decided to take practical steps to accomplish this strategy. Palestine leadership initiated seven-step program. The first uh, step was, or the first priority for them was negotiation with Israel, but only on the final status. The second one was to submit a formal request to the United States to recognize the Palestinian state within the 1967 border. The request was presented to the Americans and met with a refusal. Step three was an official bid to the Security Council requesting acceptance as a full membership in the UN and asking the American not to veto against the proposal. The first three steps of the plan have failed. Now the Palestinians need to consider if and when to continue or to move to the next steps, and, and what are the next steps? Abu Mazen decided, uh, Abu Mazen just said a week ago that he is going after the 26th of January to be free to use all the other options. So the, 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 the other steps are the, uh, the option that he considers them as the way to go further. According to the Palestinian Initiative, the fourth step is appeal to the General Assembly on the UN, of the UN for special session on the basis of Resolution 377A, Uniting for Peace, and ask for membership. Uh, voting under this resolution overrides the Security Council and avoid the American veto. Then, if they are going to get it, they want to be accepted as a member to the United Nations they wanted to request the Security Council to declare Palestine an internationally sponsored territory. And if it will be, everything is if here, but that's the plan of the Palestinians. They want, uh, they, want to, uh, they want to renounce all agreement of Israel, and step number seven is a request to the United Nations to declare Israel an occupied power in order to impose sanction on Israel. This new strategy was drawn up after Palestinians understood the improbability of negotiation with Netanyahu government, as well as their hopeless feeling of despair because of the rapid growth of settlement, which are considered the biggest obstacle for the two states solution. Israel government, not just Netanyahu government, right-wing government, have in a, in, a, in, in a slow, inexorable, progressive process annexed the West Bank by building settlement. This was done either by indirectly helping or turning blind eyes when new settlement or outposts were built. In 1993, there were 110,000 settlers living in the West Bank. Today, there are more than 350,000 settlers living in 127 settlement and more than 100 outposts. This does not take into account the 200,000 Israelis who are living in East Jerusalem, where the Palestinians consider as an occupied territory and they aspire to build their capital here. Allow me to say 
that if at the time of the Oslo Accord, the map of the West Bank looked like a jigsaw puzzle with Israeli and Palestinians knowing more or less what their direction was, today the layout of settlement, checkpoints, the road system, the security fences, the barbed wires, the, wa the, the walls, the, the graffiti, the different flags facing each other looked like a cocktail. And I don't hesitate to say that this is a poisoned cocktail, an explosive cocktail. Today, the struggle between the two communities living in the West Bank, the Jewish settlers and the Palestinians, are, is not just ethnic, national, and territorial conflict. The struggle has intensified the conflict by filling it with religious content, and that has worsened the conflict and made it religious, inflammable, and intractable. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict over the West Bank to me seems as a zero-sum game. However, aside from Israel, there are another reason or lessons that more profoundly related to the dramatic acute development and the, the, the events that have, that have been here during the last decade and have significantly influenced the Palestinian society as a, as a society politically, social, economically, and psychologically events that mobilized them to adopt the new strategy. The first event was the, first intifa the second intifada, because the brutal bloody uh, ter suicide attack forced Israel to launch an attack on the West Bank and reconquered all area that were under con full control of the Palestinians' authority. The Israeli response was war, which destroyed the infrastructure of the Palestinian state in the making, such as public and governmental institution, parliament building, the Gaza airport, the prison, the government compound, all of which were destroyed. Worst of all was the social destruction. The division of the West Bank by the IDF to nine cantons, accompanied by hundreds of checkpoints, in order to achieve better control, caused people to lose their jobs, unemployment, increase the social, cultural, and political uh, collapse of the life. The second intifada was almost, almost brought the Palestinians to a second Nakba. Therefore, they took the lessons and they learned from, this, from it and, to, and they understand that terrorists cause them a lot of problem, not only politically tarnishing their image, but also they paid a heavy price. They understood that it had come impossible to overcome Israel by terrorism. All the changes, and I'm saying it again in a loud voice, all the changes and development, especially the victory of Hamas in the election and the changing tactics of resistance in the West Bank could not been achieved before Arafat, uh, before Arafat death. I argue that Arafat death on the 11th of November 2004 mark a turning point in the ethos of conflict within the Palestinian society. A strong and charismatic leader has a huge impact on the ethos of conflict of his people. Arafat for, the, for his people was much more than a human being, much more than a symbol. He was a myth in his life. He, has, he was an idol. When Arafat looked in the mirror, he didn't see his face with the kafia. He saw at least Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. This kind of leader who could mobilize his people did it with a magic flute, with the magic flute of the Pied Piper. Arafat death marked the end, or more precisely, we don't, I don't want to say the end, but the, the mark the time out of the ethos of armed revolution to the end of the rifle myth as an option for liberate Palestine. Arafat death pushed Hamas toward the election and victory. Hamas would not have dared to complete the election during Arafat time and would not certainly have run against him. Abu Mazen, his successor, brought a change of percep perceptions. No more armed struggle, mean terrorism, but, resident, uh, but resistance through popular uprising, resistance through state building and democratization, and a struggle through international support, especially the United Nations and its agencies. According to Abu Mazen, this is the third intifada. This is the way to remove the occupation, and this is the way toward the statehood. 
Now he wants to accelerate the intifada of delegitimizing Israel occupation, not the state of Israel, the occupation, and to reappeal to the United Nations. During the last year, and we, again, we have to be honest here with the, what's happened, he consolidated his power and his position within the Palestinian society. Today, he is strong enough, enough even to reach a political agreement with Israel. He does not need Israeli gestures in order to strengthen his power. But all these circumstances are against him. Israeli government consider him a dangerous enemy. He lost his allies in the West, especially in the United States. President Obama is busy, as I said, with the next election. The Arab world is disintegrating. Fatah has lost his power, Hamas being stronger. His people, the Palestinian people in the West Bank, are frustrated. Many have ceased to believe in the option of two-state solution. And if, and the key word is if again, there will be reconciliation, it will lead to election. Election will lead to Hamas victory. And there, if will be a Hamas victory, and the Palestinian president will be Ismail Haniya, I don't know what will be the Netanyahu reaction. I think that I don't need even to answer this question. Abu Mazen is so frustrated, hopeless, and discouraged. The feeling is that he wants to take the responsibility of his shoulder. He declared that he will not run in the next election, planned in next May, and his decision creates serious problem because Abu Mazen has no successor. He has not prepared a successor that will continue his way, his political agenda. The big question is if after his time, the Palestinians would not return to Arafat ethos of conflict. Therefore, there, what, therefore, what I think is that Israel should encourage Abu Mazen to continue his duty by taking advantage of the windows of opportunity that the Arab Spring still allows and to renew the negotiation based on the vision of two-state solution. I don't want to, seem, to be seen as a pessimist. I'm realist. Therefore, I can't talk about breakthrough in the, next, in the, in the near future, namely the next, the next year. Once again, the Palestinians are frustrated, desperate, facing a deadlock, standing within a complicated maze with complete loss of their futuristic outlook. They already realized that the creation of viable Palestinian state in the West Bank with East Jerusalem as its capital is no longer realistic option. They are helpless and powerless, but they are determined to continue their struggle. They are motivated by collective emotion of frustration, frustration, anger, and hatred, and mobilized by societal beliefs such as victimization, justice, a, a, a justness of goals, positive collective self-image, even patriotism. All that could easily, could easily ge uh, generate waves of violence that rated into new round of armed intifada. Once again, the Palestinians are wavering between occupation and statehood, taking, lacking the ability to change the balance of power, but with readiness to continue their struggle. Yes, they want and they are looking forward for their own Arab Spring. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Thanks, Ronnie, for your very significant and intriguing analysis. I'm sure that uh, some, of, some people like Newt Gingrich wouldn't uh, approve it. Uh, I don't want to intervene in American politics because he claims he's a professor of history. There is no Palestinian people. But this is another subject. And uh, now we are moving to uh, the topic, just following what Ronnie said, the Arab Spring and its impact on the Palestinian system uh, by Dr. Ido Zelkovic, who is a postdoctorate fellow in Göttingen, Germany. He teaches in the part of uh, Middle East history at uh, Haifa University, and he, he deals with uh, Palestinian uh, history and politics Israeli-Palestinian conflict, student politics, and higher education. And he already published um, some uh, works of the Fatah embrace of Islamism. 
and his upcoming book is The Fatah Movement, Islam, Nationalism, and Politics. Ido, please. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the Arab Spring and its impact on the Palestinian political system. The outbreak of the so-called Arab Spring was, uh, was met by a weak and fragmented Palestinian society, which was in the process of searching a path out of the political deadlock it had encountered. In the wake of the complex reality that emerged, both the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas government in Gaza scrambled for ways to secure their political dominance, each on its uh, own stretch of land and discussing entirely how to overcome the crisis that they were facing. Has the spring, which is changing the face of regimes across the Arab world, passed over the Palestinian society? For many years, in actual fact, since the Nakba up until the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian enjoyed a relative advantage compared to the Arab counterparts. Their leadership were not granted the opportunity to downright suppress its people. Up until the founding of the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian had not established a sovereign role with a territorial continuum which would probably have developed into a monarchic or republic party based on a mechanism of oppression. Paradoxically, the national operation of the Palestinian in the Arab states and under the Israeli establishment had created the infrastructure for the development of a civil society, a flourished civil society. This society formed an, formed an integral part of the mechanism which was, uh, which was central to the state building process of renewed Palestinian national identity. The key role of the civil society had assumed since 1948 in the maintaining of Palestinian identity that created a sphere of discourse characterized by openness and the greatening of a political leeway. The, uh, this preserved the principle of national unity around which all Palestinians could gather in spite of the difficult differences and division between and within the various PLO factions since the 1960s. It was precisely the establishment of the Palestinian Authority which suppressed this vibrant civil society as it subjected the inhabitants of the West Bank and Gaza to a structured regime based on the model of the surrounding oppressive Arab states. The civil society organization and the student movement which had challenged the Israeli regime were now either absorbed and persecuted by Palestinian mechanism. In addition, the financial channels which supplied funds to the civil society came under supervision and monitoring of the PA. Nowadays, in spite of the Arab Spring, the West Bank is still in Hebrew, is still in Hebrew nation. The relative peace and quiet in terms of security raises the following questions. Can the regime be considered strong and stable? And what is the actual form of the regime? In light of the ongoing political divide between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the political apparatuses in the West Bank and Gaza Strip are still profound, and the civil society is dormant. The voices heard in the West Bank do indeed praise the stability of Abbas's regime and the, economic, and the economic indicators point to stability, and maybe even improvement in certain parameters. Even the political attempts to dethrone Abbas, coordinated by Al Jazeera, which dedicated an entire week, an entire week to exposing the negotiation documents, also known as the Al Jazeera documents, did not stir the expected commission in the Arab world. Hamas, on the other hand, had managed by virtue of its monopoly over the use of power 
to tighten its grip on the Gaza Strip, and the fear barrier in the Gaza Strip did not give away. The events of Hamas turmoil in summer 2007 are still in the minds of the population. Nevertheless, the young Palestinian population, thirsty for a change, looking on their reality, see the relative economical uh, prosperity in the West Bank, together with the fear factor on the Gaza Strip, and raise the question of when this dormant energies break laws and uh, how they will be channeled. Yet one must ask oneself whether such matters could actually affect the current situation, considering the, change, the changes in the Arab world and the notion that the young generation across the region draws encouragement and strength from the increased freedom of expression and their ability to generate change. The Palestinian experience teaches us that the old guard is willing to enter into deliberation and even negotiate a change in the political power distribution so as to preserve their position of strength. For instance, the leadership of Fatah and Hamas were apparently attentive to young voices, albeit few, which called for the end of the inter-Palestinian divide. The geopolitical changes in the Arab world and the inhabitants of one side to overshadow the other paved the way for discussions. The willingness of both parties to enter into deliberations regarding an intra-Palestinian reconciliation is one of the most striking outcomes of the Arab Springs. The futile tactical maneuvers initiated by Mahmoud Abbas in his plea to the United Nations managed to guarantee only limited achievements. These efforts may have maybe reinforced his image as a stubborn leader true to his path and preserved a certain level of Palestinian hope, but they did not change the political situation on the ground. The flexibility towards Hamas displaced by Abbas is an indication of the desperation which took hold of the Palestinian Authority decision makers on account of their Israeli counterparts. For instance, Abbas address to the UN Assembly which outlined, uh, which outlined the historical Palestinian narrative was meant for Palestinian and international ears. The speech itself was firm and utterly ignored the Israeli partner, which Abbas is ultimately supposed to sit with at the negotiation table. The disappear which privileged amongst Palestinian decision makers in the West Bank was compensated by the celebrations of the Palestinian Authority officials which managed to secure the Palestinian bid to UNESCO. This achievement was an indication of Abbas strategy, continued diplomatic efforts aimed at guaranteeing an official recognition of Palestinian of Palestine, sorry, as the 194 member of the United Nations. In light of the diplomatic efforts, orchestrated by Abbas, the, thre the threats of his close associates that if no, program, uh, no progress is achieved, Abbas will dismantle the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinians will opt for realizing civil equality vis-a-vis -vis Israel should not be taken so seriously. The Palestinian Authority is one of the most successful startup in the political marketplace. It provides the daily bread of many Palestinians and even managed to, uh, to accumulate some success in terms of sovereignty, Abbas will not readily dismantle such a successful project. Mahmoud Abbas will must probably redouble his efforts to put the, diplomatical, uh, the diplomatic efforts of the PA back on the Palestinian agenda and sideline the gains of Hamas following the prisoners' exchange with Israel, soldier Gilad Shalit. In the last round of the battle over public opinion between Fatah and Hamas, Abbas had gained the upper hand. After showing his might vis-a-vis -vis the United States, uh, the fact that Abbas continued with his plea to the UN despite US objections had, infu uh, had infuriated the State Department. The American threat to withhold their founding of UNESCO only increased the popularity of Abbas in the Palestinian streets which not only uh, perceives the U.S. as Israel's major ally, but also as a symbol of global imperialism. On the other side of the Palestinian divide, in the Gaza Strip, Hamas failed. Hamas failed 
to leverage the prisoners' rep with Israel to present an alternative which would truly challenge Abbas. The Palestinian Authority managed to contain the spontaneous outburst of joy in the wake of the prisoners' exchange between Hamas and Israel, and even a forbid to hold, uh, to hold sorry, back from preventing the display of Hamas flags in the West Bank, a scene not witnessed in quite some times. The Shalit deal was made possible by the changes brought forward by the Arab Spring. Hamas, which initially founded itself in a tight spot, in a, in a tight spot following the events, managed to emerge as a robust movement capable of adopting the change of the times. The heightened tensions along the Egyptian border also with Israel after the terror attack near Elat in August actually enhanced the dialogue between Israel and Egypt on a series of security-related matters. This dialogue was also a factor in promoting the prisoners' rap deal as Egypt wanted to prove that it was still a center pair in post-Mubarak area and able to fulfill the role of responsible mediator. However, one must remember that there are also power struggles within Hamas. Once the groups forcefully took, forcefully took over the Gaza Strip, becoming the sovereign power there, it began to bear direct responsibility for the lives of the Gazans. Hamas in Gaza took heavy blows since the takeover and Shalit kidnapping, culminating in Operation uh, Castlid. Beyond the heavy price that has uh, that the movement paid, it was also required to rehab, uh, to, rehab, um, to, rehab, uh, um, to rehabilitate the strip as a poverty-stricken territory that is one of the most crowded places on earth. Gazans raised their eyes on to the West Bank, where Abbas succeeded in the established in the establishing state infrastructure, and, conclude, and uh, concluded that Hamas has failed them. Hamas. Inability to present a diplomatic achievement led the Hamas Gaza leadership to apply extra pursue on Hamas leadership in Damascus to push the deal forward. Nevertheless, Hamas is att attentive to changes which have occurred in the Arab domain following the Arab Spring and is adjusting itself accordingly. Hamas had concluded that the next confrontation with Israel will be decided not in the battlefield, where Israel is by far superior, but in the diplomatic corridors. On the political front, the main rival of Hamas is not Israel, but Fatah, which is the backbone of the PLO um, and was declared as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people since the resolution of the uh, Arab League conference in Rabat in 1974. Even since it was established, Hamas had aimed to succeed PLO as the legitimate Palestinian representative. The path to realizing this goal passes through the inside, that is by taking over PLO from within. Hamas demand that the gates of PLO will be open to him might transform to inter-Palestinian power balance to include not only the, re the red, uh, red distribution of power and Hamas participation, in PLO decision making, but also the allocating of financial resources to the movement and its eventual legitimation in both the Arab Muslim world and the international community. The recent travels of Hamas Prime Minister to Egypt Um, the recent travels of Hamas Prime Minister to Egypt, where he met the heads of the Muslim Brotherhood and to Turkey, in which he was greeted by Pre Prime Minister Erdogan, are step in this direction. Hamas now is looking for international legitimation. Haniya visit to Tunis and the warm welcome that he received over there, including, among guest, um, other things, a call to eradicate the Jews and kick them out of Palestine uh, symbolically demonstrated the historical and cultural changes which had occurred in the Middle East following the Arab Spring. The same city 
which treated Arafat as almost as its mayor, if not prime minister, uh, now is welcoming Hania, the head of Hamas, which is giving public speeches in uh, its stadium. There is the, Tunis is not a base of Fatah anymore, but is Tunis a symbol also being um, concurred by Hamas. Hamas is currently in the process of searching for political legitimacy. The declared accept, acceptance by its leaders of the PLO a strategy of establishing a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders, which is capital is, is Jerusalem, is not a strategic, a strategic change, but rather a tactical maneuver. In actual fact, Hamas adopted some of the principles of the PLO 10-point plane of 1974. Thus, exact some principles that Khaled Mashal was required to endorse when he sought to participate in the elections for the Kuwaiti office of the General Union of Palestinian Students in 1974 as the head of the Palestinian Islamic List. Then, he said no, today is part of the political sphere and he must be more pragmatized. So you can see history is being changed. Marshall had then refused these demands and the gates of the PLO were shut closed in front of him. Nowadays, he paradoxically acknowledged that he paradoxically acknowledged Israel's existence, but rejects its right to exist. In addition, Hamas had also declared that he does not denounce the path of violence and when discussing the change the movement is undergoing, this proclamation should not be taken lightly. Hamas is an adaptive movement, yet its fundamental worldview is encored in religious respect, uh, respect, it cannot shake off. To a certain extent, Hamas demand to become integrated into the PLO establishment as part of the intra-Palestinian reconciliation, reconciliation process might put a spoke in its wheel. Even since PLO signed the Oslo Accords, Hamas had attempted to, uh, to appropriate to itself the ethos of armed struggle with Israel. At the expense of Fatah, of course. Since Hamas became the ruling party de facto in the Gaza Strip, more and more activists broke away from the movement on account of their objection to what they perceived as a political pragmatism. Indeed, the more that Hamas tightened its grip on Gaza, so did the friction between Hamas and Israel decrease. All the more so when considering the lesson learned by Hamas from Operation Cast Lead. In sum, the marriage between Fatah and Hamas is not a match made in heaven. Each movement marches to a different tune as their divisions in terms of society and culture do not concede. It is difficult to predict how the long process of reconciliation will unfold, yet might bear a resemblance to talk between Israel and the Palestinians. Long, exhausting, technical, and eventually barren. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ido, for your uh, thoughtful and updated account. And this is uh, Palestinian politics. Now we're moving to the other side of the divide. Uh, Israel's strategic options in facing the Palestinian challenge. And we are very happy that we have with us Dr. Yair Hirschfeld, uh, also teaching at Haifa University, a fellow in various places, including Rice University, and his claim to fame, everybody knows, since 1980, he was engaged in Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking efforts. He was a member of the 100-day policy planning team of Shimon Peres in 1984 and 88, and then led uh, in 1992, started the Oslo negotiations, 
the famous Oslo negotiations. Nobody, no, not everybody in Israel agrees on the, 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 on the outcome of it. Uh, then having develop, developed bridging concept and obtaining support from the Israeli government at the time, as well as uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, he unofficially tracked the official May uh, 20, 1993, um, the Oslo Accord, of course, when Hirschfeld joined the official Israeli negotiation team. There is more to read, but I don't want to take his time. Yeah, here, please. Many thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll try to be as clear as possible. Um, there, there are very important people in the room. I'm happy to have the ambassador of Norway, um, Martin Indig, our very, very distinguished friends from Egypt, um, we're very happy to have such a distinguished audience here. Um, so it makes the challenge even far, far more serious and bigger. Um, I'm supposed to give you the Israeli strategies, and um, I will tell you that at my early stage in speaking to the Palestinians, I had a meeting with Elias Fredge, who was mayor of Bethlehem, and he um, told me, <coughs> yeah, yeah, um, before you speak, first listen. Yeah. And... Um, so um, what I will do um, is, is something a little bit complicated to do in 20 minutes, but um, I will give you um, four conceptual strategies, um, and I will put them uh, into four possible, um, possible uh, zones of possible agreement, um, how they would fit um, an agreement that Israel could look for with the Palestinians, with Egyptian support, with Jordanian support, maybe Saudi support, uh, and international support, um, or other things that could go the other way around. And let me give you the four scenarios, and let me give you the four zones of possible agreement. The, um, first, the, the scenarios are taken from what was the Montfleur exercise in South Africa, and the first um, uh, scenario they, call, they gave it wonderful names, and you will immediately understand what it says. The first scenario was called the ostrich scenario. Uh, now, you obviously imagine that the ostrich scenario is another way of saying business as usual, and we don't see the Middle East in transition. It's, uh, yeah. it's uh, everything is, well, is worse, and we don't easily change. And maybe because there may be some transition, we don't do anything. Um, this is definitely a scenario the Israeli government could adopt. Um, I will go into it. I'm not sure if I would um, recommend to do this, and we'll speak more about it. The second scenario the South Africans referred to was the um, Dedalus and Icarus. Um, I don't know if you remember the story of Dedalus and Icarus. They flew up to heaven, and it was so close to the sun that their wings melted, and they whoosh, fell down and died in the sea. Um, the, um, this means that you, if I translate this into Israeli, Palestinian, Israeli, Arab relations, you go quickly to permanent status agreement, you come very quickly forward, and it pitch, doesn't actually help. Um, the third scenario that, you, um, that they um, developed and they called was the lame duck scenario. Um, we, we may be closest to this one at the moment. The lame duck scenario is that you go on a certain path and you make one meeting after the other, um, one negotiation session after the other, one maybe little agreements after the other, they don't change anything. And the fourth scenario was called the flight of the flamingo, that all, all birds take off slowly and in an upward direction, but all together in a coordinated manner. And um, what I can tell you very clearly in the Middle East in transition, there are a lot of common interests between Israel, the Palestinians, the Egyptians, and the Jordanians, and I would say also Saudi Arabia, and definitely also the international community. And the interest is to maintain as much as possible stability and to prevent movement into a major, uh, major war and terror. So there is a common interest. But the question is, the difficulty is, how do you develop a strategy where all of us can somehow take off together in the flight of the flamingo? Now let me check this against zones of possible agreement. Anyone who's dealt in negotiations know that you should, that doesn't obviously happen, to before you start negotiations, find out what is the zone of possible agreement with your other side. And there are four theoretical zones of possible agreement. Zone of possible agreement, I'll go from 
doesn't matter which way I go from, from the, the first zone of possible agreement, that you have full agreement on everything and you solve all outstanding issues. And per, uh, agreement on all core issues, Jerusalem, refugees, settlement, security, um, like whatever you want. Um, that would be the one zone of possible agreement, the highest one. The second one is the zone of possible agreement which <coughs> Paul Lederach in his theoretical works has referred to. And he says in a prolonged, in a prolonged conflict, um, you can't always solve the agreement, solve all the outstanding issues at one time, but you can diffuse the major issues, the major issues causing the ongoing ongoing set of, um, set of conflict. And I will take my strategy suggest in that direction. The third, the third zone of possible agreement is on process. That you agree to meet and then you agree another thing to do and they have an organized process. I don't think we can do without the process. But I, I don't think that process is good enough. We have had, um, um, our American friends are uh, big, big specialists in, 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 in process development. But um, if you read the, the wonderful book of Martin Indyk, um, uh, which I've got a lot of criticism of Martin on, on, on many things, but the book is probably the most professional, professional book I've seen and read uh, on, on the last um, 15 years. Um, and, and it's a very impressive book. But anyway, um, the process is not enough, but, it needs a, it, it, but you can't do without a process. The fourth zone of possible agreement, and don't forget it, it may be very important, is an understanding of rules and engagement. We with Hamas don't have, an, have a ceasefire, but we have rules of engagement. They move the rockets, we kill the guys who move the rockets. There, can, there is a give and take that you say, okay, you move beyond this line, there, is, there are rules of engagement that we can help. So let me test these four, these four scenarios against these four zones of possible agreement and see how they mix together in the Middle East that has changed during the last year quite dramatically. <coughs> the ostrich scenario. On the ostrich scenario, um, I can tell you um, that the, this is a strategy that um, the Egyptians are coming to us and the Egyptians are saying, uh, you know, um, Egypt has to build its revolution in the coming year or two, and it needs stability, and it needs to revive itself, its um, constitution, its economy. Um, we, don't, we want to keep this real thing out of it, and so far it's been kept out of it. In business, of, business, um, business as usual, um, if, uh, if things are not, if, if matters are not moving forward, they're moving backward. And the likelihood that rockets of 45 kilometers that are already in Gaza or other, um, or the other missiles that can be sent from anywhere else will create an ongoing move. There is our chief of staff spoke about the possibility if there's no other chance to move into Gaza. This will have a major effect on, the, on Egypt. And so the fear is that um, if we don't come forward with something beyond business as usual, this will heavily undermine and go against the Egyptian interest, which means that we might have a common interest on the other scenarios, but definitely not on this one. And I can tell you from Jordan the same. I can tell you that there was a Jordanian delegation here some time ago, not so far away ago, and they said if you believe that the cooperation can go on like this under changing situations, you live in an, in, in an illusionary world. We have to move forward. And as a matter of fact, out of this, um, of this mission, Jordanian mission here, um, both the Palestinians, also was the visit of His Majesty King Abdullah to Ramallah meeting um, President Abbas, out of this came the renewal of negotiations um, now in Jordan. Um, but it is very clear that Jordan needs some kind of push forward and the business as usual um, scenario doesn't work. I'm sorry, this is the Jordanians agreeing with me. I'm sorry. Uh, um, the, um, the, um, the Palestinians will tell you, and um, we've heard the thing is, we move, um, we can move towards uh, the Third Intifada. The idea is there are plans to move on Jerusalem, 5,000, 6,000, 8,000 people, to move on Allenby Bridge. I've been in a situation in 2001 where there was a coordinated demonstration during the Intifada where we fully coordinated with the Palestinians and it totally got out of hand, particularly because the security authorities were coordinating one with each other. 
because you don't you don't know how things develop. One guy shoots and hell breaks, breaks loose. And there's no question that the reason that there's no been provocative actions by the Palestinians during the, 12, the last two or three months is that they understand that the third intifada will lead to will lead one way or the other um, to a renewal of violence. And the renewal of violence will be a disaster, disaster for them. It will be a disaster for us. It will be a disaster for the Jordanians. It will be a disaster for the Egyptians. So what I would say, if we search for a constructive strategy, business as usual is not the issue. Now let me look at the Daedalus at Icarus one. Now, if you read Condoleezza Rice's book, she says, you know, um, when we had the agreement, with, almost the agreement between Prime Minister Olmert and Abbas, he said, I agree, Olmert is offering 5,000 5, um, refugees back, back to Israel as a symbolic move of the right of return. What will I say to the other 4 million? The moment you say something like this, there is no permanent status agreement with Israel. So if we look, if we are serious, if there's a serious dialogue, dialogue between us and the Palestinians, and believe me, I, I'm engaged in this on a daily basis. Um, if there's a serious dialogue, they can't deliver what is necessary for a permanent status deal, and we don't want to deliver, and we also don't can't deliver. You know, if we wanted to go for a real permanent status deal, we have to take down 120, 130,000 settlers. I don't see any government that can do that. Um, definitely not the government of Mr. Netanyahu, but I don't see any alternative to it. Um, so if we want to go for failure, go for the most, the most aggressive so zone of possible agreement. And part of the difficulties we have today is that the part of the international community, part of the Israeli left-wing good doers, um, which I like very much, um, part of them are still on a, on a telem, they are still on the road, which in the moment there is no way of getting there. So if you, want, if you really want to move forward, the good, um, the, the very good is the enemy of the good. And don't choose something which is due to failure by not 95%, but by 100% in the coming, you definitely if you want to do it in the coming year, or even a little bit later on. So the Daedalus and Icarus scenario, what I would say is out. Don't speak about it, no side can deliver, no side really wants to deliver on it. The Palestinian side doesn't want to live, deliver on end of conflict. Hamas definitely doesn't want to do it, but also Fatah doesn't want to do it. And on all of the issues that Israel will need in order to go there, there is no possibility of matching, matching a deal. This gets us to the third, to the third scenario, and the third, third scenario is, is the lame duck. And I must say, and don't misunderstand me, this is not cynical what I'm saying, also it may sound so. Um, uh, the, um, I have enormous appreciation of the work the Quartet are doing. Some of them are my best friends. Uh, I've worked together with Robert Serry in 1989, 1990. And, um, and, and I think that um, the people in the quartet uh, are doing a potentially very, very good work. And they have laid out, they've laid out a, um, um, a, 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 a guideline how to move forward. On September 23rd, um, we go to um, diplomatic truth, or what they call de-escalation, um, and then we prepare for negotiations and um, we move forward. And um, at the moment, um, there is an agreement between the American government and the Israeli government that uh, neither Washington nor, um, nor Jerusalem recognized the 26th of January as a, as a date. Um, uh, and there can be no decision what to do be, um, before the 26th of January. And I will tell you that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu is involved in um, in internal elections until the end of January, so definitely will not be the 26th of January. But still, the 26th of January is a date. And if we, um, the, the lame duck, the, the, the ongoing quartet thing as it is, uh, it's a wonderful talking club, but it has lost a lot of its, a lot of its um, belief um, what can be done and what cannot be done. The confidence of the Palestinians in the quartet let him put it mildly, is um, limited. Um, the, um, the, Israeli, the Israeli side um, is afraid of uh, giving them too much power and will do everything to work around the quartet by going directly to Washington. Um, 
So um, the um, the guidelines, the guideline, I believe that the guidelines of the quartet are very serious. The guidelines are this uh, de-escalation, then a period of speaking, then going to negotiations on territory and security. Now, going to negotiations on territory and security, and has been the case during the last days, is we come back to the old formulas. The Palestinians say everything good. Now they say 98.1%, and we get 1.9%, which no government will do. Um, and we say, I don't know whatever we say, but we even don't. We, the, the big advantage, the big move progress in negotiation that has happened during the last two days is that we have accepted, the Israeli side has accepted the Palestinian proposal, which so far we haven't done. Um, this is, this is lar f largely goes into the lame duck and can be very close to the, um, very close to the business as usual thing. The question is, how do you turn this quartet concept into something that, is, that would help to lead what we would call the flight of the flamingo? That something that the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Saudis, the Palestinians, we and the quartet can go for and use. Now, till I have all the magicians in my, in my pocket, um, the answer is I don't. But I can give you some slogans which um, can say what are the strategies that we can develop. Um, and I will give you one very simple slogan. Instead of saying, instead of saying, let's, let's, instead of negotiating territory and security, let's negotiate a concept saying from, from separation to independence. You have a majority in the Israeli public who want a separation between them and us. You have a commitment of our prime minister to a two-state solution, which means independence. How do we move? How do we move from separation to independence? This is not only territory and security. This is state building. This is infrastructure. If, for instance, only as a negotiation device, I tell you, let's look at areas A, B, and C in one issue. Let's look at them in one issue. And let's put the, let, let's the, put the, the Palestinians a, a proposal on the table and say our state building in area A, B, and C in all areas up to the 4th of June 67 is going to be here we'll build the roads, here we'll build, here we'll build the, um, um, the airports, here we'll build electricity. I'm sorry. Uh, anyhow, we, here we'll build the state. Um, we can say, okay, let's see what do we do in the next year, what do we conceptually move for, and how do we move for forward. Now, we have said something else. The one slogan is, let's go from, from, from separation to independence. The second concept is, let's negotiate in two tracks. Let's have a long-term a long -term track and a short-term track. Let's see what happened, what do we do in the coming year, what do we do afterwards? But we have both an interest, all of us, all of us have an interest to make major, sub, major headway in the short term and have some basic understandings of going to the long term. We have some ideas how to handle this and what can be done and what can be done. Um, but there is a substance that the negotiators and the policy makers can work on. Um, if you want me to, to tell you a, j a joke, I'd like to end with the joke. I have two jokes, actually, to tell. There is a joke for the bad case scenario. If you tell me, uh, if you tell me that this strategy, which I would have to work out um, to, to be more detailed, which I don't want to be, um, if I'm more detailed on the strategy, um, I, I will tell you the likelihood it's going to happen is, if I'm optimistic, 10%. The likelihood that we go to something between the ostrich scenario and the lame duck scenario is very high. Uh, and in this case, I can tell you the following story. Um, because this is going, going to happen afterwards. Is you have a, 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 a lady who's married comes home too early to her, to see her husband. And the husband is in bed with another woman. And, um, and I shouldn't do this in public, such a joke, but anyway, it's not so bad. And, um, uh, and she shouts and shouts and shouts and shouts. And he says, darling, let me explain. And she goes on shouting and shouting and shouting. And he says, darling, please let me explain. 
But she goes on shouting and shouting. So I says, you know, I'm happy you're still shouting. Because if I would have to explain, I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> so if we don't go to this strategy, I don't know if we will have something to say. I have another nicer joke, but let's end with that one. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yair, for your very colorful and comprehensive uh, analysis. And now I invite comments, not lectures, and uh, questions and queries uh, short. And I, I would like, uh, let's start the first round and collect uh, questions and comments for the various speakers. You can name them if you want. And then you accumulate and then answer, OK? Not by by one because we don't have too much time. Please. Big question: How, we, how if there's going to be a peace or something like this? I want to tell you it's intractable conflict, but the conflict is not one-sided conflict. We are also part of the conflict, <laughs> and if you want to make peace, it's not for the Palestinians. It's for us first of all, and then for the Palestinians. Yeah. And if we came here in order to be a democratic Zionist, and I don't want to go to all those slogans, we have to find a way how to. <coughs> Separate after so many years. He was talking about 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 women. With your permission, here can I talk about the about women? Yeah, after 40, how how many years? 60, 67, 44 years. I'm saying it's in a loud voice. We in one bed without sex. It's time to divorce. The question is how to get divorced. And that's the question. And I don't know how. I don't have it. But I know that somebody from outside, perhaps, will have to come and help us. I'm, as, as, as she said here, I'm pessimistic because I don't see the Israel is going out of the West Bank. 350,000 obstacles, 300,000 people, <laughs> and nobody can take them out. So, so it's a problem, but we have to find please, please. if if we want to, to, to stay, to live here as a strong nation and people, we have to find a way. I'm leaving it to, for the politician. I'm here in the academia. That, that's not my job. But I'm telling you, I have some, some thought that uh, we have to do it. I'm afraid that if, and I'm saying it, if the Palestinians are not stupid people, and if they have the, the plan for the initiative for the future, and if they are talking about sanction on Israel, we have to think about it also. And that can be because 126 countries today, tomorrow I don't know what's going to be. I don't know what's going to be the next time, in the next election in the United States or not with the United States, how it's going to be. But we have to find it. Peace, peace, I don't know what it means, peace. People said in Egypt it's not a peace. Of course it's a peace. Even it's a cold peace. Even we put now the peace not just in, in the colder, colder place. But it's a peace, it's better than a war. And that's what we need. I'm not going to, to a, it's not a love story with the Palestinians. It's not going to be a love story, never. Because it's not just a collective memorial. It's not just a collective emotion. It's not just a narrative. It's so many things together in this, uh, in, 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 in this, uh, in this conflict that it's making it intractable. And in intractable conflict, we have to find a way how to manage it. Even Hamas and Fatah, they know that it's un now it's it's not it's not possible to manage the, the conflict between themselves. But they are making all the efforts in order to find a way to manage the division between themselves in order to fight against Israel. You are asking me why who, what, what what's going to be what's the, the solution? The solution is for me, not just for the Palestinians. That's what I think. The solution is for me to live here in a Jewish democratic state. I have to fight to, to fight for it. It's not going to be easy after so many years. I don't I don't I don't know. As I said, if we are not going to do it quickly with the help of the European, with the help of the American people, with the help of really new people that will bring a new initiative, that's going to be a disaster for us also. Why I'm thinking about Hamas? I know Hamas. I'm I know what's happening in the West Bank. I'm talking with many people. Even Palestine, the, the, the people from Fatah, Fatah collapsed. There is no Fatah today. When Arafat was the, prime, the, 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 the president, he needs Fatah in order to have a lot of power and in order to, 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 to have a control of, on the people. Now Abu Mazen, he did the same thing as in Israel, Ben-Gurion did here many, many years to the Palmach. He said to the Fatah, 
that you're not your time. There is no Fatah today. Fatah, I used to say, it's like the Labour Party in Israel. They are <coughs> not Labour Party, at Smaut Party. That they don't have any power. And Hamas is slowly, slowly, even here in the West Bank, are getting more and more power. And the, the Palestinian people, when they are thinking about the Arab Spring, they are thinking also about the mood or the atmosphere of the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring is a green spring. And the green spring will come also here. In Gaza, they are not so strong today, Hamas, as they are strong in the West Bank. In Gaza, they, have, they, they are doing a lot, the, 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 the government of Hamas, especially during the last six months. They are building, they are good with their people, they are gi gi giving money. Of course, it's not enough, but they don't, they don't care about economy, they don't care about building, they don't care about state, even the, the building a state. They are care about one thing, to get rid of the occupation, and to get revenge and to make revenge to the Israeli people. And the emotion here in this conflict is so strong that I don't know. Therefore, Hamas is going to, to win here because Fatah is not doing nothing in order to reconstruct it, the, uh, the power again, in order to stand against Hamas. I hope that there's going to be no election. Can you pass it to you? Uh, many thanks for the question. Martin, um, <clears throat> I think it shows, the, your question shows the difference how it looks from Washington and how it looks from here. First of all, I didn't think I was optimistic. Um, I wasn't optimistic because the end of the story was the joke, and the joke wasn't optimistic at all. Um, but I tell you where the difference of the, how it looks from Washington and how it looks from here. Um, uh, and, um, and I'll give you before that uh, a short thing, I was uh, interviewed by um, Arut Sheva, um, the um, very right-wing um, illegal, um, at, least, at least at the time it was illegal. They asked me, why do you speak to those terrorists? And they said, you know, if you give me the Canadians as my um, neighbors, I'll speak to the Canadians. We will live with the Palestinians, whatever happens. And you, I don't know, but according to a question, you think in terms of success of negotiations. Negotiations is a means to an end. It's not, it's not a strategy. We may need negotiations, we may not need negotiations. I want to change the situation on the ground. Now, even the situation on the ground, I have reason to a little bit of optimism. The answer is, looking backward, yes. Looking forward, no. Now, looking backward, I can tell you that in 2007, 2008, my little organization, with General Jones, as General Dayton together developed the bottom-up concept. And it was, of course, Salam Fayyad who did it. But we got, in the end, the Israeli government to go along with it, and even Bibi Netanyahu is part of it. There's been, between 2007 and 2008, there's been enormous headway in state building, in security cooperation, in a monopoly of the security. And man, on many, many issues, there's been dramatic headway. And when in, when, we, when we finished Oslo, there was the right, uh, the, the Palestinian ethos was the ethos of, the ethos of, um, of resistance and the ethos of the right of return. The ethos of state building didn't exist, let's you say about Hamas today. The ethos of state building today exists. And we are talking to our Palestinian counterparts and to very important ones. How do you change it on the ground? Now, why I'm not optimistic towards the coming, yes, it has, the bottom up has reached a certain has reached a certain limit. And it needs understandings, understandings to break these limits. Now, if we can think of a strategy that can break these limits, the answer is yes. The answer, if we would have a partner in the United States that would listen to us and wouldn't be only involved, and I'm not angry about it, would not be only involved in, 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 in elections, which I, I understand I would be too involved in, it would be easier. Um, but we, the question is, if we, if we have an understanding of what we can do in the substance in the coming year and beyond that, on the ground, change realities on the ground, there are many things the Palestinians need, there are many things we can do. The difficulty is, is not the success in negotiations on, on love and, and brotherhood. The difficulty is how to create this, this, the, the structure and actually to make it happen. Um, do you need negotiations for it? Do you need a non-negotiated thing? Do you need an international structure? We've got many, many ideas. We have many ideas, we're checking these ideas, and we're checking these ideas with the people who are decision makers. 
Now, if you ask me if the likelihood it's going to happen, the answer is the likelihood is not it's not going to happen. The difficulty is the difficulty is that um, um, there is no trust between the three major leaders of this world, I don't know of this world, but of President Obama, the, the, the relevant Nathan, Netanyahu and, and Abbas, there's no trust. And if you ask me on the Israeli side, is I believe there's goodwill. I believe there's goodwill on behalf of the Prime Minister. There's no understanding what a doable quid pro quo is. They don't, if you look at them, I've quoted one, I don't want to give names, but one of the people very close to the Prime Minister goes to the, to the West Bank and he only sees settlements and he's very happy. He doesn't see that there are any Palestinians there. And that's difficult. So if you tell me, if you ask me that I'm optimistic, I'm not optimistic. If you tell me if we can work on strategies um, <coughs> before violence, during violence or after violence that will change the situation on the ground, the answer is yes, we can. And yes, actually, we can move there. Well, uh, regarding to Mahmoud Abbas um, moves, as I see things, Mahmoud Abbas uh, now is more concerned about the inner uh, Palestinian situation and not about the negotiation with uh, Israel. I think the most uh, important achievement that he had in the past six months is the um, press party the, in Cairo with Khaled Marshall when he sat over the table and received the legitimacy again of the, his legitimacy as, a Palestine, as the Palestinian president, not just as the chairman of the PLO, but as the Palestinian PA president when Mahmoud Abbas uh, sat yes, uh, on the main stage and uh, Khaled Marshall sat down in the crown as guest honor, but not as a part or as a um, part of this move or even as a partner. Uh, to this reconciliation of this reconciliation now uh, i don't think that uh, mahmoud abbas that um, had some kind of let's say uh, an historical perspective about how things uh, a historical perspective on the develop uh, the development of the israeli palestinian conflict will will break down the tools and we say well i had enough from you the israelis please take back uh, please take again the kids and start to manage the occupation. He doesn't want to do so. He now building his uh, structure of uh, power. Uh, he must uh, rebuild some kind of, let's say, patronized system that uh, will uh, help him to um, manage the inner threat of Hamas. He sees the state building process, I think, as the project of his life. He wanted to be signed in the, um, or he wanted to be mentioned, mentioned in the book history as the founder of the Palestinian state, as the leader who built a state. And uh, in the end of the day, I think uh, all of these moves, all of these threats are uh, being shot to the air in order to force Israel to sit back to the negotiating table under his own terms, under his own conditions and he wants to put Israel under an international pressure and the reason that the, and, and the reason that he do, he doing so is not just the channel with Israel but is also now I think looking on the international community and seeing the travels of Mr. Ania and Khaled Marshall all around the world and he doing this in order to receive back one, once again the international legitimacy and to force Israel to sit back to the negotiation table because you know that now he have an alternative. So this is my Thank you. answer. Thank um, you. We have a few more minutes. Any pressing questions, please? Thank you. Uh, just one more uh, issue if you have time. Uh, an old new idea that the Palestinians are now entertaining as a solution, a confederation, not federation, confederation between Israel and Palestine. And I would add another old idea, a three-party confederation, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Uh, and this has been discussed among the Palestinian uh, intellectuals. So uh, you start, Edo, and then we go back forward. Okay, um, 
Regarding to the legitimation process or uh, the trying to do the, the legitimation to Israel, I think uh, this is one of um, the most effective um, tools that the Palestinians have today. They're doing so, I think, also in as kind of a tactical maneuver to enforce Israel to sit once back to the negotiation table and and they're trying to portray it. all of, uh, I don't know it's kind of all of Israel, but uh, especially the um, settlements as an illegal, um, um, as an illegal uh, move according to the international law. Now, uh, the question is that, that uh, if you can or should negotiate with someone that's trying to, uh, let's, tr let, let's say, um, uh, with some, we decide they're doing the legitimation uh, to your existence and trying to portray your your your, your existence as uh, the legitimized, uh, while you're trying to find a, a solution to a conflict. Now, uh, even though after we can, after we're going to receive or to achieve, I think um, an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, I don't think that this uh, phenomena will uh, end. If we're talking about uh, education and educating people, I think these processes uh, have to go to a long, uh, or let's say a, a long timeline, at least 20 or 30 uh, years of, of education that will bring a change. Now, I don't see the Israeli society on the one hand and the Palestinian society on the other hand, working to do so and working to do so in order to change the reality that we are living in it. So I'm also very um, pessimistic about uh, uh, our chance to go uh, forward with the Palestinians and I think this delegitimation is also one of the obstacles that we should take in mind uh, when we are trying to resolve this conflict because we, in order to resolve it, to resolve it we must look all the time in two different dimensions. One is, of course, the political field, how to do it, yes, what is the solution. And I think if we're trying to, um, to, to, to find the mutual, we, could, we can do it. That's not the problem. We, we know all the formulas, and we just need, uh, we need now a leadership with courage to, to, to change reality and sign on agreements. But the, 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 um, let's say the biggest challenge on, on both sides is how to educate the people uh, to think differently and to adopt um, to to adopt the understanding that a change can be done and the reality that we are living in it is not a, let's say a perm a permanent um, reality so the legitimation yes or no well pity that they're doing so but things can be done I don't think this is the end of the, the world. Israel exists and will be exist. We should not um, to take this legitimation as, let's say, as a, a strategic threat on Israel. That's my answer. On the regional issue, I'll tell you, I'm, um, from President Abbas's point of view, he has had, before the Arab Spring, the support of President Mubarak, the support of King Abdullah II, and largely the support of, the, of Saudi Arabia. Um, and there was some support of Turkey also. Um, I must tell you that Prime Minister Olmert told me in four eyes that Prime Minister Erdogan prefers Hamas and not him. Anyway, let's leave that aside for the moment. Um, so um, if we want to move forward, we have to move forward with Abbas. We can't move forward with Hamas. They don't even want to talk to us. Um, so um, the... Um, what we are talking about is, um, uh, is there, are there activities that can be quietly, publicly, in any way supported by a coalition that Abbas doesn't go alone to see? If he goes alone to see us, he feels there's a symmetry that works against him. If he has the backing of Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and of the Gulf states, um, uh, he is in a better situation to do it. And what we are thinking of is um, this can be quiet, this can be public, there's all kinds of ways of doing this. Um, but to go alone, well, there's this all kind, there's incitement and all this going on is going to be very difficult. Now, from my sense, um, there's a common interest 
of the region to, to take care of the difficulties that are so far, so far, and it's an interest also of Mr. Netanyahu, so far, um, the, um, um, all the troubles in Egypt and in Tunisia and in, in, in Yemen and in Bahrain uh, and in Syria have not the label Israel. We're not far away from the place where everybody will start to accuse us. Um, maybe some part rightly and a lot of part very unjustifiedly. And it will get this kind of delegitimation and mutual inheritance in practice. So we have to work on a regional, on a regional equation. Now the regional equation that is there, where there's a lot of interest, is um, there, there are two, two things happening that make a dialogue theoretically possible. Um, and the one is that um, there's a common fear of Iran, and there's a common need to put, to contain Iranian aggression and um, activism in the area interested in destabilization. And the second thing, and it goes together, is um, a, an ongoing clash between the Shiite and the Sunni world. And, um, and, and the question is, how do we turn this one way or the other into a um, conflict. Now the truth is that the issue of delegitimization, the issue of delegitimization is that part of um, Qatar, for instance, um, they, if you lose Al Jazeera, there has been incitement to war in many things, on the Arabic thing, not in, the, not in English. In English, they're very liberal and decent. Um, but we have to find a way also how to diminish this delegitimization thing. There's much, much disinformation on the side, and I can tell you that I'm speaking to, to Egyptian, Jordanian, other interlocutors, and telling them, for heaven's sake, um, the, this, 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 this information about Israel, which we call delegitimization, um, is, um, is hurting you, it hurts us, but it, and it causes you, it causes you to trouble. Now, if there are ways and deals to do, to do it, I'm not sure, it's so easy to delegitimize and it's so difficult to stand up. We have a saying that we have a rabbi uh, who, has a, who was asked by a butcher and says, I want to get from you a sign that my, my meat is kosher. He says, but I know that you've got pork there. He said, if you don't give me the sign, I will go in the streets and say you're the sister of the, of the rabbi is a whore. He said, but I don't have a sister. He said, okay, run after me and tell everybody that you don't have a sister. The question is, how do we tell everybody that we don't have a sister in this case? Thank you. Please, very, Ronnie. very, very short. Delegitimization is against occupation, and I'm saying it again. I don't know if you are, if you know what's happened during the last six years in the Palestinian Authority. They are not, of course, there is a lot of problems, but most of the delegitimization is against the occupation. The minute that, uh, and, and that's what they are uh, doing everything. Now, secondly, about the books, there is some problems, not a big problems. Um, we are looking just on one side. The minute that we are going to stop, the minute that we are going to, stop to teach the Nakba, the minute that we are going to talk about our neighbors, the Palestinians, even in the Israeli books, there is no, the, the word Palestinian is not, is not appear there. Because you have to understand, this conflict is not just about territory, it's not just religious, it's not just a, a cultural. It's also a conflict of two of two nations, of two narrative nation, a, a conflict of two collective memory, and, co and, and, a, and, a, and a conflict of emotions. And with emotions, if you are not going to understand that that's the first thing that we have to do, to find a way to make lower that these emotions of hatred, anger, and frustration of the both sides. If not, they're going to be, the conflict, the conflict will continue as exactly as it is today. We really need a break. And we have a coffee break until the official opening. Thanks very much to the speakers and the audience. See you shortly. <laughs>